So what's good, TMG fam? It's your boy Ellen. I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. Now, the Book of Enoch. We've touched on it, and we've continued to touch on the Book of Enoch a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more each time. And more we do, the more we learn about it, man. I think we've made some significant progress in it, but we're not done. So this video here, man, is the book of Enoch banned from the Bible reveals shocking secrets of our history. All right. So we're going to check this one out. So if you're new, hit that subscribe button, join the family and spam that like button. Let's get to it. Did you know that the Bible is the same for different Christian denominations? Protestants believe in only 66 holy scriptures, while for Catholics, it's 73. But there are also some religious writings the Vatican would like to forget. These texts. The Vatican. Always at the center of it, right? That's the, that's the secret meaning behind the Vatican. Always at the center of it are called Biblical Apocrypha. That's all because the stories are literally the opposite from what we've been told for centuries. I guess millions of people would hardly have taken Jesus' teaching seriously if he was hot-tempered, selfish, and hated women, would they? Yet yeah, that's exactly how the Savior is described in the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Barnabas, on the other hand, says that Christ was a mere mortal, not the Son of God. During the Last Supper, he allegedly jumped out of the window and escaped. And in fact, Judas Iscariot was crucified instead of him. A rather shady role model, isn't he? But compared to this text, which dates back to Old Testament times, even the most bizarre apocrypha seem to be nothing. From this holy scripture, we learn that angels consisted of flesh and blood. The first space flights took place before our era, and God is actually a creature from another world. But why, despite all these incredible revelations, could the apocryphal book of Enoch still be true? The Vatican can... Listen, y'all, I know the sound is a bit, the music is a bit a touch high in the video, but that's cool. It's, it's too much great information for me to turn it off, so stick with me. <laughs> considers the book of Enoch to be utter nonsense. However, could it be because it actually contains valuable information that is inconvenient for the modern church? In 1946, teenage shepherds from Palestine found clay pots full of ancient manuscripts in a remote cave. Among them, there was the original book of Enoch, who isn't a new character in the Bible. The text dedicates five verses to someone called Enoch. From them, the reader learns that he was an ordinary, righteous man, a descendant of Adam and Eve's son, Seth. Supposedly, Enoch lived in the third millennium BC and spent only 65 years on Earth. However, according to the book of Genesis, then he spent another 300 years, quote, walking with God. Theologians are still arguing about what exactly this phrase means. Recently, Bible scholars have come up with a new entertaining theory, but we'll talk about that a bit later. After all, other ancient sources mentioned that Enoch wasn't an ordinary man when he lived on Earth. One of now, everything I've heard about Enoch so far is that he was extremely, like, in his faith. His faith was just unmatched, unwaverable. And ultimately, isn't that what got him to heaven without death? His faith? So, and then I want to get back to the beginning part, bro, where they talked about Jesus the way that they did. I, I've never heard that before. Like, it's, it's really got me thrown away. I've never heard that aspect. Him jumping out of a window during the Last Supper. Never heard that before. Interesting. 
The ancient Egyptian chronicles Kitah states that Enoch participated in the construction of the Great Pyramids. In addition, his name is engraved on the so-called Weld Blundell Prism, an ancient Sumerian artifact containing the names of the great rulers of the time. Could it be that it was through such connections that Enoch learned what the Bible only mentions briefly? But why did the Vatican dislike his scriptures so much? The entire Book of Enoch focuses on the Old Testament prehistory, that is, the times leading up to the Great Flood. The first part deals with the creation of the world and the first humans, Adam and Eve. Despite some deviations, this fragment corresponds most of all with the canonical biblical scriptures. But then Enoch tells about events that for some reason weren't included in the Bible. For example, the book of Genesis, known to all Christians, tells us that girls from earth began to marry, quote, sons of God. And as a result, giant children were born. However, Enoch devoted a whole section of his work to something that only takes up a few lines in the Bible. So what was really happening on earth at that time? Enoch claimed that the sons of God were the fallen angels, whom he also called the Nephilim. One day, these angels rebelled against God and decided not to return to heaven, but to live with people. Despite God's prohibition, the leader of the Nephilim, Samyaza, ordered them to let humans know all the secret knowledge, astronomy, metallurgy, magic, and medicine. But these sciences only led to an increase in injustice. The so, and, and this is where they say we gained our knowledge from. You know what I mean? Our advancement in technology. You know what I mean? We can credit everything or how far we've come today from this moment in time is what some people refer to as. I, I mean, show me otherwise where you can combat that information. It makes sense. It definitely does. These sciences only led to an increase in injustice. Those who were able to master the new knowledge faster began to oppress others. Moreover, the Nephilim themselves became a source of sin. Each of them seduced a woman from Earth. In such unions, giant children were born, but Earth's resources weren't enough to feed so many giants. Soon, they became tyrants, oppressing people, and some even practiced cannibalism. According to Enoch's version of events, this is why God had to triple the worldwide flood to get rid of these giants and restore harmony on Earth. Interestingly, decades ago, this whole story was considered quite true. Some lines from the ancient Holy Scripture are even quoted in the canonical epistle of Jude. Furthermore, representatives of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewa Hedo Church still consider the Book of Enoch an integral part of the Bible. But the Vatican just couldn't accept that sin was brought to earth by divine creatures. After all, in Christianity, only humans are traditionally considered the source of sin. Most of the clergy disliked the Book of Enoch so much that they began to argue for its inferiority. In 1898... And that's the problem that I have with it, right there. Somebody else made the decision for us that, like, we didn't need that information. That information is vital. When you talk about the floods, when you talk about uh advancements or or how did they learn how to build pyramids or do this and do that back in the day you think if some people would have had that information that would have been the answers to a lot of the questions we had who who knows we weren't afforded that opportunity to make those decisions for ourselves that's the issue i have with it British researcher Henry Heyman published an entire investigation in which he claimed the ancient text was written not by Enoch himself, but by a dozen unknown authors far from religion. And the controversy surrounding the sacred scripture has not subsided to this day. 
Just recently, in 2022, the Tomorrow's World Portal published an article where the Book of Enoch was called a forgery. But would the representatives of the Vatican try so hard to refute the ancient scripture if it differed from the official version of the Bible only in details? Maybe the Book of Enoch hides many more secrets, and historical inconsistencies are just a great excuse to divert attention from them. Especially since this ancient text correlates perfectly with other stories of antiquity. In his work, Enoch described the children giants of the Nephilim in such detail it was as if he had the opportunity to personally interact with them. And recent discoveries indicate that this fantastic assumption may not be so far from the truth. Plus, huge men have been mentioned not only in Greek myths and the Old Testament, but in hundreds of stories around the world, and some of them have striking echoes of the events Enoch described. For example, the people of Central African tribes believed that their entire family descended from a giant Mbombo, whom they later honored as a god. According to the legends, some Bombo also sent messengers to Earth to finish the creation of the world and help people. But some of them failed in their task, just like the Nephilim, according to Enoch. In addition, we can find something similar in Chinese mythology, although these regions are separated by thousands of kilometers. There, the giant Pengu created the world by chopping up the endless chaos with a huge axe. This created two equal parts of the world, balancing each other, yin and yang. Pengu entrusted his assistants to organize the world, and he ascended to heaven. Don't you think all these stories are different interpretations of the same events? Then we read in Enoch about how the angry Lord ordered the Nephilim to be placed, quote, into darkness by those who didn't betray him. Does this remind you of anything? Exactly. Ancient Greek Titans. Like the Nephilim, they feuded with the chief god Zeus and were later overthrown and imprisoned in the dark abyss. Well, and we've heard that in, in his, in, throughout history, how a lot of the Greek mythology and stories were similarities from story, stories from the Bible and vice versa, depending on where you're from is what you believed in. We've heard that a lot, or at least we have. I can't speak for everybody outside of this community, but we've heard that in a few of the videos that we've watched. So he's definitely on track. Zeus and were later overthrown and imprisoned in the dark abyss, Tartarus, and they were giants also. In many languages, the words Titan and Giant are still synonymous. There seems to be a direct connection between Enoch's story and ancient Greek beliefs. But then, why does the official Bible make virtually no mention of prehistoric giants? Could it be that the church wants to hide the fact that giants used to have much more power? Many stories in American folklore don't just mention giants. They say giants once lived side by side with human beings. And it was in this very area that archaeologists once discovered something interesting. Excavating one of the burial mounds, researchers saw an incredible picture. In the center of the mound lay a skeleton that reached a length of over two and a half meters. Wow. The deceased person wore forged copper bracelets on each wrist and a heavy mica necklace on the chest. It was obvious that this giant had been honored in ancient times. The most interesting thing was that at least 10 more ordinary people were buried around him without expensive jewelry. Can we confirm this is legit? And nobody like planted or set this up and and built or, or set this skeleton out there. Can we confirm that this is legit? Anybody have any type of reference material I can go look to to see that this was legit? Because I'm one of one who do believe that giants and the whole story of the Nephilim and all of that, everything that took place actually happened. So I want I would like to see. Uh, I would like to see that. 
scientists had the impression that they had found a burial site of a giant monarch and his closest subordinates. Does this mean that thousands of years ago, giants ruled over all of humankind? This is There's another story overseas where they found some back in the day. Some giants, some skeletons of, of giants that, that once ruled the earth or roamed the earth. Let's not say ruled, roamed. So this isn't the first time. Assumption is certainly not supported by the Vatican, but it's confirmed in the Book of Enoch. Despite all of God's prohibitions, people honored the giants, the children of the Nephilim, because they were, in fact, also half divine. Some researchers suggest that some of the giants managed to survive the Great Flood, and then people again appointed them as their rulers. Could this be what the Vatican has been hiding from? from us for centuries? Or could the reason priests dislike the Book of Enoch lie even deeper in more daring statements of Enoch? After all, the author of the ancient text claimed the Nephilim might have been not fallen angels, but aliens from outer space. And if you think that for a man who lived 5,000 years ago, this is too fantastic of a statement, wait until he tells you the amazingly accurate facts about the structure of the universe. According to the Bible, Enoch was one of the first. I'm almost to the point where aliens, Nephilim, are pretty much all the same to me. However you want to call them. Aliens, you want to call them the Nephilim. It's pretty much the same thing at this point to me. People on Earth. It would be reasonable to assume that at that time, humankind knew nothing about the features of celestial bodies. However, in his book, Enoch detailed some astronomical facts. One of the chapters of his work is called Heavenly Luminaries. In it, the author tells us that the sun and the moon pass through certain gates. He's aware that the Earth's satellite doesn't shine itself, but only reflects reflects this sunlight. Yet, depending on this, he distinguishes different lunar phases. Such descriptions lead to two incredible conclusions at once. Enoch understood not only that our Earth is a sphere, but also realized that it revolves around the sun. However, we're accustomed to believing that something like this was first discussed by Nicolaus Copernicus in Galileo Galilei only in the 16th century. Moreover, in his work, Enoch also describes the characteristics by which it's most convenient to classify the stars. In his opinion, the luminaries should be distinguished according to their weight, their light, and the amplitude of their places from our planet to a particular celestial body. But this is how astronomers now typify stars, according to their systemic magnitude, brightness, and distance from Earth. On some pages of the ancient scriptures, precise calculations are given, and they are quite consistent with modern observations. He not developed an entire system by which he calculated the positions of the sun and moon on any day of the year, and it remains valid even today. But how did Enoch acquire all of this knowledge? After all, if we assume that his intellectual abilities were several millennia ahead of his time, he just couldn't have come to some conclusions by observing the night sky from Earth. For this, he had to have seen our planet from orbit. And perhaps that's exactly what happened. In one section, Enoch talks about the, quote, treasury of light and thunder, strange phenomenon of Earth's atmosphere when luminous energy accumulates between the clouds, which later falls to Earth during a thunderstorm. Of course, the author is referring to ordinary lightning, but from Earth, it's certainly impossible to see how it is formed. However, astronauts on the orbiting space station have the opportunity to observe this phenomenon every day. Enoch himself claimed that all of this was told to him by the highest of God. Once he even had the honor of visiting the palace of the highest, Enoch wrote that the walls and floors there were made of mirrored crystal, and it was illuminated by a light, quote, bright as fire, but cold as snow. 
This description bears a striking resemblance to our usual modern artificial lighting, wouldn't you say? But the most amazing thing is that the palace of the highest could float in the air. Enoch traveled on it, where he could see for himself that Earth was round and revolved around the sun. It's interesting that in an ancient Indian epic, there's an image of Vimana, a luminous flying celestial palace, which, if necessary, could become a refuge for various deities. If we compare the fragments of the Book of Enoch with Hindu myths, it seems as if they describe the same phenomenon. But Enoch couldn't have been in such a remote part of the world. But the so-called flying palace probably wouldn't have had any trouble traveling that far very quickly. So is the whole Book of Enoch not a religious text, but a detailed description of an encounter with aliens? Could this be the reason of- Oh, that's definitely a reason for them to want to keep it a secret. That relinquishes control. No, no, they don't want that to get out. Of course that's buried somewhere in that type of, even if we did get the book, it wouldn't be in there or it wouldn't be authentic. I don't know, that's just me. This is where my conspiracy theory self starts jumping into play. So I wholeheartedly believe that is a very legitimate reason why they, why they removed that and why they don't like that book being talked about. So is the whole Book of Enoch not a religious text, but a detailed description of an encounter with aliens? Could this be the reason of why it was so disliked by the Vatican? Any Christian would agree that angels and God live beyond the mortal realm. But the Book of Enoch adds some truly extraterrestrial details to this idea. Remember the enigmatic biblical phrase that Enoch quote, walked with God for 300 years. That was his space tour with the Lord. The Book of Enoch describes how the angels first helped him to bathe in a special solution, quote, smelling of incense, and then gave him a divine robe. It was, quote, so snow white that it seemed to emit light. Only then did the Lord allow Enoch to enter his mysterious palace and travel. It seems Remember, they talked about he was the one, if I'm not mistaken, Enoch was the one that let us know that it was levels to heaven. It wasn't just what I've always thought about, just a heaven, just a hell, just that. And that's just it. Now, it was levels to it is what I recall. So when you compare that to alien space, different areas and levels of space. Or to allow Enoch to enter his mysterious palace and travel. It's easy to conclude that this is a figurative passage that symbolizes the purification of the righteous believer before meeting the Lord. Except that this isn't the original text of the Book of Enoch. It was first known in Europe only in the 18th century. A traveler found a copy of an ancient text in Egypt. It was translated from Hebrew into English by theological professor Richard Lawrence. But some of the expressions in the Book of Enoch were completely incomprehensible to him. Lawrence wasn't dissuaded. He simply replaced all the strange phrases with his own words and threw out some of the passages. When this was revealed, other researchers tried to translate the text in their own way but only made things worse. With each new version of the Book of Enoch, there were more and more free interpretations and popular theses of the time. As a result, whole passages began to resemble modern sermons, while the original Book of Enoch became increasingly obscured. However,
But one question still remains unsolved. We're used to thinking that aliens must be a completely different life form, intelligent reptiloids or giant talking rocks. Why then does he not describe the fallen alien angels as humanoid beings? How did he even manage to interact with them? In 1984, British astrophysicist might be able to explain why they can walk among us and we don't even know. This is Fred Hoyle published a book called Evolution from Space. In it, he suggested that life might have first arisen outside of Earth. This alien civilization had evolved to such an extent that it was ready to inhabit other habitable planets. In Hoyle's view, that's how humanity came to be. That is, humans are not in fact a new life form, but those who existed outside our planet long before. In that case, we're all just a lost in space branch of some extraterrestrial civilization. And even if the specific climate and millions of years of evolution have changed our appearance, certain similarities with our cosmic forebears have still not disappeared. So are they trying to say that we're not originally from here? That would explain a lot too, if that's, if that's true. That's a possibility. That would explain a lot. Now, I'm not talking about the ones of us that were born here. Yeah, we're from here. But originally, think about it. We have still not answered the questions about human origin. It's always it leaves us unanswered anytime we discuss it. And then have you noticed as of recent, they said it started here. But then more information came out. And the date got pushed back, said it started there. Then more information came out and it kept getting pushed back. You notice that as well? <laughs> Just maybe when we finally get to that point where we can't push back no more, they might start looking up and saying, okay, well, where did we come from? And the answers could have been staring us in the face the entire time. Isn't that why Enoch called the fallen angels not human beings, but humanoid? That is, they were like us, but a little different. The same theory can explain the contact of the Nephilim with our women. After all, if we all came from the same ancestor, women from Earth could well have born children from aliens. After all, in our DNA, there are traces of Neanderthals, meaning mixed marriages between human species doesn't look like a fantasy anymore, but a reality. And when we are now beaming signals into space, are we actually trying to establish contact not with another life form, but with our distant relatives? Of course, both the Vatican and... Oh, 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 oh. Game changer right there. Is that what we've been doing? Have we been sending signals out into space? Trying to find our home? Trying to make contact with our kin? But disguising it as trying to just make contact? <laughs> oh, I'm trying to be super unplugged from the Matrix, baby. Serious historians write it all off to Enoch's fantasy, or even to a deliberate falsification. Still, additional confirmations of the Book of Enoch indeed exist. In the 70s of the last century, American astronomer Carl Sagan drew attention to the unusual myths of the Dogon people who live in western Sudan. The images in some of their stories were very different from those typical of the region. The natives even claimed that a real god had visited them not so long ago and told them some of the mysteries of the universe. Of course, first, it would seem like some fantasy. However, it soon turned out that in the early 30s, a European traveler had come to this area. And since the Dogon people had never seen anybody like that, they took him to be a supernatural being. As for the mysteries of the universe, apparently the traveler was just trying to tell the tribesmen the story of a popular book about the star Sirius for fun. And when he left, 
all his stories had grown to incredible details and turned into real myths. And this occurred over just several decades. Who knows? Maybe the aliens just showed Enoch some video from their own version of the Riddle Channel. What do you think? I think things just got a bit more interesting if you ask me. But I want to hear what y'all have to say. What are y'all thoughts about this? This one kind of took me all over the place and has my mind just going crazy right now. But, you know, I want to hear more. I got to hear more. It, it's, I'm drawn in, so I'm, I'm committed. Y'all get at me and let me know what you think in the comment section, man. Stick around and stay tuned. Till next one, I'm gone. Peace.